Our next speaker is going to be Paul Wiggins uh, from the University of Washington. Uh, Paul, unfortunately, is, uh, video, his video is not working, but uh, his Zoom is working fine. Uh, so Paul is going to tell us, move to a, a totally different area of biology, and is going to talk about uh, gene expression in bacteria, uh, when is too much not enough. So uh, Paul, thank you for coming and take it away. Thanks, Ashok. Sorry about my camera. Um, yeah, I know the question I have for you today has to do with the, the regulation of the central dogma. And like all of these problems, we, we started working on something else. And so the basic picture with the central dogma is it basically explains information flow in biology. And so we often work on replication. We're not going to work on it that much today. We're going to be interested in the transcription and translation processes. And the big question I have for you today is what's the rationale for how we regulate these processes? How do we optimize them? And so the kind of accepted view is this Goldilocks hypothesis. You kind of adjust your expression levels so they're somehow just right. And I think this is my ex-advisor from a long time ago, um, actually not so, not so long ago. Um, this is the sort of estimate you might imagine making. So if you want to estimate the number of proteins you need in a cell, what you do is you figure out the total activity. So take the replication, sorry, sorry take a protein synthesis, for instance. So ribosomes, you figure out how many proteins you get per ribosome per cell cycle. You figure out the total number of proteins you need, and you just divide those two. And that'll give you the estimate of the number of ribosome complexes you need. And you can see here, this gray curve right here is kind of the theoretical estimate. These dots represent experimental measurements of the number of that complexes. And you can see for protein synthesis for translation, you do pretty well. Um, but let's look at some other processes. So here's carbon transport. Again, the gray curve represents the estimate. These dots here represent the measured number of proteins. And suddenly, remember the scales are log, things don't look so great. And so the question really is, what sets the levels in the cell? And I hope to persuade you today that the answer is not as obvious as you thought. All right, so what's the, what's the motivation for this Goldilocks hypothesis? The idea is pretty simple, right? So here, if the levels are too low, you clearly get the failure of essential processes in the cell, uh, but what's on the other side? And so clearly what's on the other side is the metabolic load. So if you make a lot of extra protein, this is gonna slow down the growth rate. And I think this is widely accepted, it's basically correct, but what I hope to persuade you today is that this optimization problem is more difficult and more interesting than you think. And so just kind of a hint about where we're going, I want you to think about ordering supplies in the lab if you're an experimentalist or baking if you're a theorist, if you cook at all. Um, think about making an apple pie. There's some ingredients, you know, apples is my classic example here where you, you buy what you need when you're making that pie. But there are a lot of other things, most of the other ingredients, my favorite example, salt, where that's not the way you work. And so you don't go to the store and buy six apples and half a teaspoon of salt. You do something else. All right, so how do we test these sorts of ideas in the cell? Um, the strategy I wanna tell you about doesn't work in almost any model system. It only works in the model system that we work on, which is ACE Nidavector Bailei. And what makes ACE Nidavector special is that it's naturally competent. And so that means when we wanna knock out a gene, it is orders and orders and orders of magnitude more simple than it is in E. coli, in yeast, any of these other systems that we'll talk about a little bit later. And so what we can do is completely eliminate the need to enrich the transformants. And so, you know, if we transform the cells and we put them on a microscope slide in the typical field of view, there'll be a couple of transformants. And so that's without any selection. And so what does that mean? Well, it means we can knock out essential genes and watch the cells die. And so that's kind of what you're seeing on the left-hand side we're knocking out uh, a gene involved with cell wall synthesis with the synthesis of precursors necessary for cell wall synthesis. All right, so here's the basic strategy. Um, here's the knockout. What happens when you knock out the gene? Clearly after the DNA is degraded, you can't transcribe anymore. And what's more, the transcripts that you have in the cell are gone almost immediately. The lifetime for a message in a bacterial cell is on order of minutes. And so it's very, very short. 
And so you might say, how does this work at all? How does the cell continue to grow? Remember these blue dots, the protein that you've already synthesized doesn't go away. So the rate of protein degradation is very low in a bacterial cell. And so the protein levels go down as the cells proliferate, but it's all essentially by dilution. And you know we can test this one protein at a time, and this is basically right for most proteins. All right, so how does this work? We make the knockout, and then we've got all the brew protein dots that we're ever gonna have. And then as the cells proliferate, the levels go down. And again, if the levels of protein were sufficient, exactly what was we need, and again, this is our expectation, what would happen is that growth would arrest right here. But of course, this is not what we see. We'll see multiple rounds of division following the knockout. And again, I won't show you this data because I don't have time. We can look one protein at a time and check that this is actually happening. It is. All right, so I'm gonna show you some quantitative analysis of the time-lapse images. This was highly non-trivial. This took us years to get it to work. I'm not going to say anything except Omnipose. We published it. Check it out. Um, what makes this problem hard is that the bacterial morphology changes dramatically after we knock out essential cells. And so here you're looking at cells without cell walls, and you can see the lice explode. Um, these don't look like regular bacterial cells anymore, and that's what makes this process difficult. All right, let me show you the quantitative analysis of the data. What we're looking at here is cell area, a proxy for volume over time. And uh, basically the knockout occurs somewhere a little bit back here where I'm kind of wiggling the mouse around. And then since we're on a log axis, it's the slope of these lines that represent the growth rate. And so again, even though protein synthesis stops back here, you can see something surprising. And again, when I first saw this data, I immediately knew that something interesting was going on. So the surprise is, right, that the growth rate is fairly constant multiple generations after the knockout is made. And again, how do we think about protein concentration? We know that things are being diluted, and so the concentration at some time t looks like the ratio of the initial volume over the volume of all the progeny, all right? So we, in fact, know what the protein levels are as well, as well as this growth rate represented by cell elongation. All right, so here's the basic picture we see with many proteins. I'm just showing you one. <laughs> We've looked at a bunch of them. Um, the growth rate's pretty constant over a quite wide range of protein numbers. And then there's some critical concentration and star here where growth stops. And you might say, why is there a step there? Why is this obvious? In retrospect, it is obvious. So anybody who's done kind of biochemical reactions in the lab knows that if you change the concentrations of various reactants, only one of them typically matters, right? There's one thing that's rate limiting. And if you change the concentrations of things that aren't rate limiting, they don't do anything. And so the fact that we see this sort of step-like dependence on the protein expression level isn't so surprising. Perhaps is what, what's much more surprising is this distance between the mean levels that we observe in the cell and these critical levels that you need for growth. So we've seen this one protein at a time, but of course there are a lot of essential proteins in the cell. And so how do we look at all of them? Well, we have a way to do that as well. And so uh, our collaborator, Colin, who kind of taught us about East Native Bacteria, got to this experiment before we did it. Um, so he did this a couple of years ago. Um, and we've gone back and we analyzed all of this data. And so how do you do this? So what you do is you make a genomic library, you mutagenize it with a transposon, and then you transform all of that DNA back into East Native Bacteria. And then you've got this multi-clonal population, basically every gene's knocked out in one of the cells, and then you propagate these cells in time, take fractions, and then map the transposons by next generation sequencing. And as a result of this, we have trajectories for every single gene. And what you see if you hit a non-essential gene is they just kind of go along at the same, oops, at the same level. So again, no change in growth rate here, and so that particular mutant maintains its rank in the population. But if you hit an essential gene, what happens is that mutant starts falling out of the population at the growth rate after they arrest. And what we can measure in these experiments is this arrest time. So how long do the cells continue at the wild type growth rate before they basically start arresting and growth ceases? And again, you can look at many different models here. You can say, oh, does the growth rate basically change continuously to a very good approximation? 
you see this biphasic behavior. So wild type growth followed by arrest. All right, so here's the answer. <laughs> so if we look at essential genes, let's focus on these because we don't have a lot of time. There are about 31% of things that are sufficient. So as we start depleting those, growth is immediately affected. But about 70% of things are overabundant, meaning that we need multiple generations of growth in order to see a change in the growth rate. And again, you can ask the question, you know, is this a little bit or a lot? This represents a 2x <laughs> depletion, right? And so right away, you can see that these proteins aren't a little bit overabundant. They're hugely overabundant. And let me kind of show you two kind of fun statistics. If we take the median over essential genes of overabundance, we find it's about sevenfold. And again, that seems like a huge amount. But let me comfort you for a second. You can ask the question, if we now take the mean and we weight by protein abundance, what answer do we get? And here we only get 1.6 fold overabundance. And so as I'll show you in a moment, the proteins that are highly expressed have low overabundance. The proteins that are at low expression levels, a bit like the salt in that apple pie, you have it much higher overabundance. All right. So those are the results. <laughs> the typical essential gene is highly overabundant. What's the rationale? Why does this make sense? All right, so here's my little cartoon about what's going on. <laughs> Why does this make sense? The thing that I think that we forget about these essential processes in the cell is there's something like 500 essential genes in E. coli. There are a few more in E. coli, a few less in E. cinebacter, but it's something like on order 500. And so here's the problem that the cell faces. There's this huge multiplicity of failure modes. The cell faces this huge problem, right? That it needs 500 things to be expressed at the right level essentially in order to get growth. And so again, here's my little cartoon, AC Nubacter hanging from the end of this chain. Each one of those links represents an essential gene. And if it falls below the threshold, the cell falls into the shark tank and gets eaten. And so again, you could ask the question, if I want to survive, what is the reliability of each of these links need to be? And again, you can do this kind of back of the envelope estimate. Here's the multiplicity. Here's the failure probability of each link. Boy, <laughs> you've got to have really great links because you've got 500 of them. And so clearly part of the solution to this is overabundance. All right, so we've got a quantitative model here. Um, I don't, I'll, I'll show you one equation later. Um, I, so here's the probability of different uh, protein abundances given some mean level. Here's this step-like growth curve I was showing you before. And again, if you're below this threshold level, you get growth arrest. And so this red part here represents the fraction of the population that are below this threshold. All right, what about the high side? I told you what was going on is this is a trade-off, right, between the load <laughs> and the stochasticity. And so the other important insight here is that the relative reduction in growth rate is much smaller than you might naively expect. And you can say, why is that? Why does that make sense? Imagine primase. This is a protein that you need in very low amounts. And so you've got on order 30 per cell. And how many, how many proteins does E. coli, for instance, make per cell cycle? It's about 3 million. And so that ratio gives you a scale for how important this relative load increase is. And, you know, 30 over 3 million is small. And so that's kind of roughly speaking where this 10 to the minus five comes from. And so what you see is an incredibly asymmetric fitness landscape. And suddenly what happens makes a lot of sense, right? So when we now convolve this probability distribution with this uh, fitness landscape, where does the optimum sit? Well, it's very far from the level that you need. Even though in the noise-free case, the optimum sits way over here, again, due to this cell-to-cell -cell variation in protein number, you have to sit right here to optimize growth rate. And that's why such large overabundances are predicted. All right, so again, you know, it's a kind of cute model. We can kind of work out everything analytically. Here's the expression level on the x-axis. And again, this is number of messages transcribed per cell cycle. On the y-axis, this is our predicted overabundance. And again, if we're sitting over here for high expression genes, what goes on here? Well, these genes, because they're high expression, are high cost. But fortunately, 
because the number of uh, messages transcribed, again, imagine Poisson statistics, because the number's large, the, ver the relative variation is small. And so we don't have a lot of variation here. There's not much to fix. And this stuff's high cost. Both of those mechanisms push you to low overabundance. And so again, for something like a ribosome, you don't make a lot of extra. All right, what about at this other end? So here's where primase sits. You've got a lot of really low expression genes. Here again, doubling the amount of protein you have in the cell is pretty cheap because the overall number is still low. And the noise, because the overall level of transcription, Poisson statistics, the relative noise is very high. And so both of those effects here push you up to really high overabundance. You can ask the question, okay, well, how much does this matter? How, much, how many parameters are there? There's essentially only one global parameter here, which is this relative load. We think the cell, the bacterial cells, uh, explained by 10 to the minus five. But again, here are orders of uh, magnitude variation in this parameter. And again, you can see there's very little qualitative change in the dependence. And so let's look at the experiments. We can do both axes of these. So transcription, how do we do that? It's RNA-seq, kind of the standard tool. Overabundance was that TFN-seq experiment I told you about with the transposon. And the red curve is our kind of parameter-free prediction. And then these dots represent the experimental measurements. And this blue curve right here is a window mean over that data. And you can see that the theory kind of captures the qualitative trend. For high expression, you have very low overabundance. And then as you reduce the expression level, the overabundance increases. And you might sit there and say, okay, well, the curves don't fit perfectly. This is an incredibly simple model and a somewhat complicated experiment. So there's some functional things that matter about the proteins that affect the measurements, but I don't have time to tell you that much about that. But anyway, we're actually pretty happy with this fit. All right. So you're saying overabundance. Well, that's just an artifact of working in this silly model system, acenetobacter. That doesn't happen in my system. Well, I hope to convince you that it does. And so what I want to focus on next are other testable predictions from this so-called RLTO model, this trade-off model that I've been telling you about. And so there's other experiments using CRISPR that are kind of consistent with what we see, uh, broadly speaking, but they're somewhat less quantitative than the ones we've done. I'm not going to tell you about those. Here's the one equation I'm going to show you. Again, you can work out these things in the limit that we work in analytically. Here's the metabolic load piece. Here's the arrest piece. Um, there are two parameters that matter per gene. So we're going to worry about transcription and translation. All right. And so we can optimize both of these. And so what we're doing is we're finding the optimum central dogma program for gene expression. All right, so what obvious signatures are there? Well, it turns out there's something that this tells us about transcription that we can test without having to do these proliferation experiments. And so what I'm showing you here is that overabundance uh, calculation, but with different axes. So this is kind of the threshold number of messages you need. You know, if there were no noise, this is the optimum level that you need to express things. And you can see, again, low overabundance, you kind of make what you need at high expression levels. But then as you ramp down to lower overexpression levels, sorry, lower expression levels, you need much more overabundance. But from this new way of plotting the data, you can see something quite interesting. So no matter how low you go, right, there's a lower threshold of what's needed, essentially just for robustness reasons. And if I were to ask you at the beginning of the talk, what do you estimate that minimum to be? You probably would have thought about it for 30 seconds and said, okay, one message per cell cycle, that seems to make sense. And after we do that entire calculation, that's exactly the answer we get. And so what we're predicting is that basically in all organisms for essential genes, you gotta make at least one message per cell cycle in order to have robust growth. And so to what extent do we see that? So here's the data. I'm just gonna show you E. coli first. This is non-essential stuff. These can be at really low levels. The solid is the essential genes. And you can see that they cut off roughly here at about one. So there are a couple things down here. The biology of these are really interesting. And again, you can ask me about that if you're interested. Think prophages. Um, and so clearly it seems to work for E. coli. You might say, okay, well, E. coli, who cares? Um, here's E. coli, different growth rate. Here's yeast, here's human. And again, these are the essential genes. And if you look at message number, so this is the number of messages you transcribe per cell cycle, all of these organisms have very similar histograms. They're all peaked in roughly the same spot, and they all cut off at about one message per cell cycle. So there are a few things out here, but in reality, very few.
right? So this idea, this lower threshold appears to be here in the data, not just in H. nidobacter, which I haven't even plotted here, but in these other systems where we haven't made explicit experimental tests. All right, people have been kind of fuming, probably thinking, why does he talk about translation? All right, I'm gonna talk about translation. So we're optimizing both the optimal transcription level as well as the optimal translation level. And so this translation efficiency is the number of proteins you make per message. The message number is the number of messages you make per cell cycle. How do we turn these two knobs? So again, this is like an amplifier with you know uh, two stages, and both of those have these independent volumes that we can control. And it turns out, you know, that this is roughly proportional to this. So the the slope is roughly one on a log log plot. And so what that tells you is the optimum way to adjust these levels is moving them up and down together. And so here's one <laughs> volume, here's the other one, and again, I've kind of drawn these as a the single knob. So they go up and down together. So is this observed? And so something more complicated is happening in bacterial cells, but this is exactly what you see in yeast and mammalian cells. And so this is uh, this dotted curve right here. This is you know, constant translation efficiency. This is kind of naively what we might expect if we don't think about the problem. And again, this solid curve here is the prediction of the model. And so that goes right through the cloud for both yeast and mammalian cells. And so this is, this is kind of proteomics data, not from our lab, but again, it's consistent with what we see for eukaryotic cells. And you might say, why do I care? What sort of interesting consequences does that have? I don't care that much about noise, but a lot of people do. This is Jonathan Weissman's measurements in yeast, and we all know how uh, noise is supposed to work. So again, this is the coefficient of variation. And of course, it's proportional to one over protein abundance. And that's this orange curve. And then you can see that although this works in E. coli, it doesn't work that well in yeast. Things will get a little bit better if you add a noise floor, but you can see that the scaling is basically wrong. So what's going on here? Well, remember, I'm telling you that the translation efficiency isn't constant. It's actually optimum to increase that as the expression levels increase. And so low expression genes are low transcription, low translation. High expression genes are high transcription, high translation. And so how does that affect things? Well, if we go back and we work out what we expect for the, the number of messages scaling with the number of proteins, there's actually a, a factor of one half here. So it's the square root now. If we put in that scaling, suddenly we capture the noise dependence on protein abundance. And again, why is this? Well, because the noise is dominated by transcription, CV squared is going like one over the message number. If we're plotting this on the axis of protein abundance, we need to correct for the fact that the translation efficiency is changing as the transcription levels change. So why does the cell do this? I know I don't have a lot of time left, but this plot kind of explains why the cell does this. So say that you were using this constant transcription, sorry, constant translation efficiency model here for these low abundance proteins, things would be really bad, right? You'd have really high noise. And so what the cell does is instead of turning down transcription alone, it turns down transcription less and turns down the translation efficiency as well. And so that'll basically reduce the noise as a consequence of basically having to do more transcription. What's the trade-off? Well, these higher expression genes, the noise goes up, but again, this matters less because these have low noise anyway. And so why does the cell use this program? Well, it reduces the noise of the noisiest proteins. All right, so why do we think this is going on in uh, other cells, you know, in addition to Acinetobacter bailei? Again, this RLTL model predicts these global features of the central dogma. There's some more. Uh about three or four minutes more, maybe. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm getting to the, <laughs> to the final slide. <laughs> Thanks. All right, so um, these are the sort of uh, new principles that we claim that we see for central dogma regulation. So the first of these principles is this protein overabundance story, which I told you about. So again, high expression uh, proteins, think the apples, <laughs> think the ribosome. Um, these are gonna be roughly the levels that you need a little bit more. However, right? These low expression proteins, low cost, high noise. And so the strategy here is we're going to push the levels up and this is overabundance. 
All right. The second strategy is this one message rule. So we claim that due to robustness, there's kind of a lower level at which anything can be made that's essential. Um, and it's one message per cell cycle. You shouldn't go below this in general. Um, and then we talked about load balancing, right? This is how you balance the transcription and the translation process. And again, in eukaryotic cells, what we see is that high, like low transcription cells, again, this has been known for some time, low transcription, low translation per message, right? High expression genes, high transcription, high translation per message. All right, big picture, does this make sense? Um, if I were to start with this figure at the beginning, I say, okay, there's this threshold of protein that you need for function and you've got noise, there are clearly two obvious strategies. So one is to push the mean up, that's represented on this side right here, and the cell does that, right? So that's this overabundance strategy here. But the other thing you could do is you could attempt to reduce the noise at roughly fixed expression level. And again, that's what's going on here with load balancing. So here, what you're doing is you're changing the central dogma expression program in order to reduce the noise at almost fixed expression level. And so the cell is doing the two obvious things. Um, let me let me say two things because I've got a little bit of extra time about uh, why this is important. So you might say, what are the implications of this? Is this even interesting? And I would argue that there are actually a lot of really interesting um, biological implications. And so the first thing I have for you are lessons for stationary phase. And so what goes on when cells go into stationary phase is they're running out of nutrients, right? And so they're basically transitioning, adapting to this starvation state. And so I think the new piece here is the realization of quite how much extra protein the cell has that it doesn't require. And so we can imagine this a bit like a protein battery, having all of this protein that can now be used to help in the adaptation process. And again, this makes predictions that have essentially already been tested in the literature. If for instance, you get rid of the proteases, what happens? The cells can't adapt to stationary phase if they can't degrade the protein. And so again, we think this is kind of a new tool for thinking about what happens in stationary phase. And again, here's Hadrian's wall. Why isn't it 11 feet tall anymore? Well, the stones were used for other purposes. All right, um, let's skip metabolic memory. Um, Let's talk about lessons for drug targets. So big picture, what problems does overabundance make for thinking about drug targets? If I tell you there are 500 essential genes, it looks like there are 500 really good targets for drugs. But consider drugs for a moment that act by reducing the activity of their protein targets. And here you can see that if you're down here at the low expression level, we're predicting that these proteins have really high overabundance. And so if you are 20X overabundant, how much inhibition of function do you need before cell growth stops? Here you need 95% efficiency. And so what this is telling you is that high overabundance proteins make really bad drug targets in general if it's uh, functional inhibition. It's the mechanism by which they work. However, why are there so many good translation targeting drugs? Well, these have low overabundances and therefore even small reductions in activity can basically give you a really potent effect. All right, so I'm gonna stop now. <laughs> Let me just thank the students that have been involved. Um, James has done most of the experiments. Colin was the one who taught us about ACE Unibacter. Um, Kevin led this segmentation team that kind of figured out how to make Omnipose work. Ryan helped us with the RNA-seq. Dean was kind of essential for kind of figuring out a lot of the theory that we needed to use for the project. And so thanks for your attention and I'll have any questions. Thank you, Paul. That was fascinating. Uh, just clapping on behalf of the audience. Uh, folks, any <laughs> questions? Uh, please, uh, you can, I would say you can, you know, just unmute and ask, uh, since I don't see any in the chat. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask while we are waiting, Paul, um, do you see any exceptions to this? Uh, to oh, this it's, of a, it's, it's such a great question. <laughs> um, so if you go back to the model and you ask the question, should there be exceptions? And the answer is, of course, yes. And so there are kind of two things you can do. So one of the obvious things you could say is, 
well, don't you know about gene regulation? What happens if you have negative autoregulation, da, 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 da. And so one of the obvious predictions you'd make is that if you look at genes that are autoregulatory, these should have lower overabundance than other proteins. All right, so that's one thing. Let's talk about one other. Um, I've talked about the metabolic load, but proteins are toxic. And so what's going to be at the top of my list there? Um, ATPases and enzymes, right? So imagine, you know, a very highly active ATPase. Here it's going to have a really high cost because not only do you have to make the protein, but you're now burning all of this ATP. And again, so the, the thing you're going to predict you're going to predict here is higher cost, lower overabundance. Mm -hmm. And again, this is exactly what you see. So here's the sort of violin plot for ATP for enzymes. And so here's the median. It's pretty low compared to all. These are DNA binding proteins. These we think are going to be insensitive. These are a little higher than all. So again, toxicity seems to be predictive as well. What about regulation? Same thing's true here. So we predicted that autoregulation would be able to be lower. It is. Um, here are highly regulated genes. And again, lower median than all. And then the unregulated guys are a little bit higher. And so look, expression isn't the whole story. Mm -hmm. Toxicity, function, all of these things matter a little bit. But overall, kind of the big picture is this expression picture. And again, I don't think I'm telling anybody anything they don't know. If they think about their own lives or they think about how they order things in lab, you act exactly like a cell does. For things that are low cost, you have a lot of extra because it makes things work better. That's a sobering thought that we are about as smart as an E. coli. <laughs> <laughs> well. But I'm going to stop recording and I'm going to just invite the audience.